Um, <clears throat> perhaps a, another question is, why not Python? Um, because it, it's, it's, and for most people, the answer to the question of like, what do we do next is, given we're using Python, we fix the problems in certain ways. So for example, in the TensorFlow world, they're creating things like tf.function, which is kind of like allows them to connect up Python to the whole XLA environment, which you'll learn about. In uh, PyTorch, um, they're using JIT to kind of turn Python into C++. Why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we just, you know, um, do the best with what we have? Because Python, to be clear, has a fantastic ecosystem and we already all know it. And <coughs> it kind of seems crazy to throw that all away. Um, I, I think you'll see the answer to this question in the next two weeks. Um, but basically, it turns out, I'm pretty sure, that um, it's easier to pick the right language and compilation environment and write everything else on top of it from scratch than it is to write everything else on top of something that was not written for that in the first place and then try and madly patch up the thing underneath to make it work. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, things like the global interpreter lock, you know, we're, everything we're doing has to be massively parallel, but Python is written so that no two things can happen at the same time. Um, so it's, it, these are things that are just incredibly, incredibly hard to work around. Or else with Swift, as you'll see, it's like the things we want is how it's designed. So why not Python? Because, you know, we think that um, we can't keep going with Python. Um, we were not the first people to think the existing languages are not good enough. Um, there's actually somebody else who had that thought a few years ago, and he's so OCD that he actually decided to write his own language, and he's so OCD that before that he wrote his own compiler, because they weren't good enough either. And so, whilst it may be difficult to be around such an OCD person, we're all very thankful that these people exist, because they create the things we have. Oh, and here's one now. <laughs> Chris, tell us about why you did this crazy thing. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I'm not the only crazy one, as you know. <laughs> so let's talk about what Swift is, and, um, and then we'll kind of go very high level, and then we'll get down in the bits. So Swift is a lot of different things. It's a programming language. If you go ask the marketing people what it is, it says, they say things like, Swift defines away large classes of errors in programs. It talks about how fast it is, and it's optimized to get the most out of modern hardware. Um, I think another aspect of it is that Swift is really ambitious, and that is something that I think you'll see over the next two lessons, where Swift isn't just about um, solving a niche problem. It was not about, like, let's make iOS a little bit better. Swift was conceived as a full stack programming language that goes all the way from scripting down to low level systems programming. So you can write bootloaders in it. Now this is, this is crazy. I'm not aware of any other language that's actually set out from the start to do that. But that's one of the reasons why it becomes really interesting and really good for this domain, because you want very high level programming abstractions and a very nice and easy to use way of working with the language, but you also want the ability to go down to the metal in the rare cases you need to. So there's, a, there's some random guy on the internet that wrote a blog post about this. I highly recommend that. Um, one of the things that he uh, says is that it's, the, the interesting thing about Swift is that you get expressivity, flexibility, tight code, you get safety, ease of use, and speed, and it pulls it together in a unique way. That's a very insightful quote, Chris. I'd like to read more of that person's yeah. work. Yeah, he, he does some good things, too. He, he's, he's a little bit crazy himself, too. So, like, d d getting out of the marketing stuff, what, what is really Swift about? Swift is a really young language. This is something I don't think that people realize. Um, Jeremy, you like to point out that Python is 25 years old. Yep. Many of the systems we're working on are 30 years old. Yeah, well, I think Python might be 30, JavaScript might be 25, Java's about 25. Yeah. I mean, it, for, for me, I've never spent time writing such a lang young language before. I also don't really remember, it's not quite true, I, mean, I, guess, I guess languages like JavaScript have developed quickly, but it's really unusual to have such a young language be so widely used. So it, there, there's definitely a feeling for me often yeah. of feeling like, oh, I'm using a language which lots of people use, yet somehow it still feels um, like not everything's fully baked yet. Yeah, yeah, well, it's kind of interesting because you have millions of programmers using it, 
but on the other hand, it can be changed. Right? And so that's one of the things that in this project we'll talk about. Being able to do language integrated autodiff is an example of the kind of thing that you can only do if on a reasonable time scale you can innovate and make new language features, get them merged in, and evolve quickly. And that's one of the things that's made this whole project possible. Swift, from its roots, was designed for usability. And so it was designed for IDEs and user experience and code completion and er inline errors and things like that. It has a refactoring engine, a bunch of stuff that modern languages have. Um, the other aspect of Swift that I think is really important is Swift is designed to be not weird. And so when you look at Swift code over the course of the lessons, it will look pretty familiar. If you've used JavaScript, you've used lots of other languages, you've used Python, it will look pretty similar in a lot of ways, and that's by design. Um, a lot of languages start out being uh, trying to prove a point about something, and Swift was really designed to be, uh, you know, there's lots of good ideas in the world, let's take them together and through a hardcore intense design process, actually apply taste and try to come up with something that is well considered and fits well together. It reminds me of... Um Perl, which Larry Wall, it's, it's developed and described as a Swiss Army chainsaw. There you uh, go. I feel like Swift has kind of got a similar feel of like trying to get the bits of everything, the best bits, but it's, it's much more curated and kind of carefully designed than something yeah. like Perl. So it fits together. And so, as we'll talk about, uh, the whole team that built Swift originally was the team that built LLVM and Clang and things like this. And so, um, many languages were designed. <laughs> It, it, you come from a perspective of, we'll create a programming language and then figure out how to make it fast later. A lot of Swift was built from the beginning to be something that compilers can use, and humans too. So what is Swift for TensorFlow? So here, we're here to rethink how deep learning systems work from the ground up. And where a lot of the systems today are constrained by being, you know, as much as you can get done in a Python library, here we're changing the language, we're changing the compiler, we're changing all the library stacks, we're changing TensorFlow, which we'll talk about. There's a tremendous amount of stuff involved in this. And one of the things that's really cool about this, and one of the focuses, is that we want to make an open, hackable platform where you can go and change anything you want in it, and you can experiment, research, explore, do lots of new kinds of things, because that's where uh, science comes from. Um, oh yeah, caveat, um, it's all broken. Fair, fair? Yeah, nothing works, no. um, which is important if you're going to be doing a, a impractical deep learning for coders. You wouldn't want to work, work with something that's, yes. that works. So, yeah, um, um, Swift is not just, very much not just for, uh, for iOS programming. It's an incredibly powerful language. And all these people that are writing iOS applications, uh, you know, can much more quickly become AI experts. Yes. Because suddenly they're, they're working with the language which, uh, language which is yeah. super cool, suddenly. And they help propel the ecosystem as well. So the, the things we'll t be talking about across the lesson are the Swift for TensorFlow project has very big bricks that are part of it. So part of it is the Tensor API. We'll touch on that a little bit today. Python integration is a really big deal. This is what gives you direct access to the entire ecosystem that you already know. Automatic differentiation, hugely important for ML. And Swift has a really cool industry-leading approach to it, stolen from Fortran. Um, Jupiter, you'll see a lot of that today. So one of the things you'll notice is that a lot of what you see as a high-level programmer is very familiar, and that's by design. And so this is an example set, of, uh, an example layer built in Swift. This is an example layer built in PyTorch. And it looks basically the same. I mean, there's differences, and we're working to reduce the difference even more. We'd love all those floats to. I go mean, away. some of the, some of the differences are very nice, like the fact that you don't have to pass self all the time, you know, yeah. these, there, there are things where I'm just like, oh, finally. Yep. Uh, so it's, it's, it's actually getting to the point where the, the boilerplate in the Python code, there's more boilerplate of like all yep. this self.conv and self.pull and self.comma, yep. and get rid of a lot of that. Yeah, so, so we're, gonna di we're gonna start very deep and very low level, so I just wanna give you a high level view of what things look like and where we'll end up. And so this is a layer. And so in Swift, this is implemented with a struct. We'll talk about those a little bit later. And it says, I'm defining my model, and it's a layer. We use layers just like you would normally, right? And so you have Conv2D, max pool, flatten. Um, uh, things are callable in Swift, and we use call instead of underbar, underbar call. You'll see a lot less underbars. Um, and otherwise, it looks basically the same. You just compose these things together. Um, one major difference is this differentiable thing. And you may be wondering, why do we have differentiable? Well, this is just telling the compiler that it should be able to differentiate this. And one of the cool things about compiler integration is that when you say, hey, compiler, give me the gradient of some function, 
uh, you know, in the happy path, when everything is good, it just does, and that's what you'd expect. But the unhappy path matters as well. I don't know if you, anybody here makes mistakes. Um, I do. And so one of the cool things about having proper language support is you can get an error message that says, hey, that function can't be differentiated. Right? And that's, that's useful. But you go farther, you say, oh, well, it can't be differentiated because integers and this in, in cast that you have can't be differentiated. And then it says even farther, well, it's actually, this is several levels deep in function calls, and this is exactly the path, and this is exactly what went wrong. And it's really cool to get this in your workbook without even having to run something, right? And so this is the, the kind of, uh, when you build things for IDEs and you build things for usability, you get really nice, um, nice behavior that the compiler's helping you. So what is Swift for TensorFlow and how does it stack up and how does it relate to TensorFlow? Um, so TensorFlow, one way to think about classic TensorFlow is that you have a tremendous amount of infrastructure. And TensorFlow has this really mature distribution, uh, scale out, end-to-end uh, -end training, uh, inference with mobile devices, like all this, all this cool stuff in the ecosystem. And then it has this thing called Python. I, I call it Python for TF. Um, and Python for TF includes its auto diff system, and then it has a bunch of APIs like Keras and Estimator and other things built on top. And so what we've done is we built a parallel stack where we're using a lot of the same infrastructure underneath the covers, and then we're building a new FastA framework on top. Now, one of the things we'll talk about more later is that TensorFlow itself is undergoing radical change in the internals. And um, one example of this is the XLA compiler, and one of the things you'll find out is that TensorFlow is um, compilerizing itself as um, new accelerators and new technologies and lots of things uh, are coming into play. And so TensorFlow is, the internals are undergoing major changes, which is super exciting. 